Hello and welcome to the talk, Building Resources, Language Comparison and Analysis. My name is Miriam Butt. I'm at the University of Constance. And before I begin my talk, I'd like to thank the organizers of this workshop for inviting me to give a talk. I think this is a great workshop. I would also like to thank um, two funding agencies, one, the uh, German Research Foundation, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, and the other, the DAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, who have funded most of the work that I will be talking about in the next few minutes. So this talk looks at the use of comparative linguistic insights in building up computational resources for South Asian languages. I'm going to um, take you through two case studies, one Urdu and one Tamil. And the way the talk is structured is I'm going to give you some background on South Asian languages and NLP, uh, talk about my experience with building Urdu resources over the last few years, then um, talk about how the program effort, which dealt with multilingual natural language processing, helped in building these resources, and then talk about current efforts at building resources for Tamil, which are also based on this program effort. And at the end, I'll offer some conclusions. So some background. My research focus has been over many years now on South Asian languages, primarily Urdu and Hindi. And South Asia is a very interesting area to study in linguistics. It has a long written history. Um, there's hundreds of languages and the major South Asian languages are all spoken by millions and all over the world due to diaspora. I've listed some major languages here <clears throat> and I've given you a map to look at. <clears throat> so while there's millions and millions of speakers and these languages are all over the world, most of these languages are actually only studied by a handful of linguists with Urdu, Hindi, Bangla, uh, maybe having the most. Um, but um, really there's very little information on how these languages work. Now, with respect to natural language processing in South Asian languages, um, due to British colonialism, English has been a major language in South Asia. And until recently, there's been very little incentive for investment in NLP from the perspective of companies. And I know this from personal experience because I've been working on Urdu for a long, long time. And um, there was very little incentive to sort of help with this development because you could make money by having English platforms. Now, this has changed recently um, in that Amazon has introduced a Hindi interface in 2018. And there seems to be some kind of competitive market going on because one is trying to capture, I guess one has captured as much of the English speaking population as one can and now is trying to target um, more of a population. So Flipkart, which is actually Walmart, um, started doing a Hindi interface in 2019, and they added an uh, interface for Tamil, Telugu, and Kannada in 2020, so just recently. This led to Amazon, apparently led to Amazon also adding Kannada, Malayalam, Tamil, and Telugu in September 2020. And this is significant because this is in time for Diwali, <clears throat> which is a major Hindu festival celebrated by Indians all over the world. So they wanted to make money there, it seems. So now let's look at these languages a little bit more <clears throat> in some detail. <coughs> Hindi is an Indo-Aryan language. Kannada, Malayalam, Tamil, and Telugu are all Dravidian. And while most South Asian languages share broad structural characteristics, so they have the same type of word order, SOV usually, verbal predication tends to involve complex predicates. The case system is interestingly similar. I've done a lot of work on this. There's mostly agglutinative morphology, etc. Uh, and you can read up on this in um, books like by Colin Masika. But um, the Indo-Aryan and the Dravidian languages are also quite different. So you wonder, okay, if the most studied language and the one that you had an interface first for first is Hindi, and I should say um, Urdu and Hindi are pretty much the same structurally, although they have very different orthographies, so there are challenges there for NLP. Anyway, you have the expertise there, then why suddenly start doing Dravidian? And uh, that might be, or that is probably because all the major e-commerce companies in India are actually in Dravidian speaking areas. So Amazon's headquarters are in Hyderabad, which is, uh, Telugu is the major language there. Flipkart's headquarters are in Bangalore and Canada is the major language there. So 
Um, so it's great that these companies are um, pushing into the market there, and it'll be interesting to see whether there'll be a significant push in terms of resource that are being released to the greater public or whether this will stay company internal. I suspect the latter. Um, and that is unfortunate because South Asian languages are severely under-resourced in terms of NLP. There are few and usually small annotated corpora, few and usually small lexical resources. And in fact, lexical resources are a problem because there's very little linguistic understanding on how to build those. <clears throat> so things like WordNet or VerbNet or um, PropBank. There's few ro robust NLP tools and software. Um, some one good development has in recent years has been that there's efforts at standardization across project sites languages. So rather than each site, okay, I'm going to do Tamil, I'm going to do Canada, and I'm at the University of Hyderabad, I'm in Mumbai, and each person just um, s makes up their own annotation schemes, etc. There has been some effort at standardization uh, with regard to with regard to POS tags, dependency labels joint um, challenges, et cetera. So that is quite good, actually. So in this talk, I want to um, do, I want to tell you a little bit about um, how things proceeded while we were building NLP resources for Urdu and Tamil. And the cooperation with respect to Urdu has been with the Center for Language Engineering, uh, CLE, at the University of Engineering and Technology in Pakistan, in Lahore, Pakistan. And there we focused mainly on Urdu, although that center is trying to do a lot more for other Pakistani languages as well. The other cooperation more recent is with the University of Moratua in Sri Lanka, in Colombo, Sri Lanka. And there we're focusing on Tamil, although that university is also interested in doing um, uh, work on both Sinhala and Tamil, the major languages of Sri Lanka. So as I already said, the cooperation with Pakistan is longstanding. It began in the early 2000s. The cooperation with Sri Lanka is more recent. It uh, dates back to 2018. And it actually developed out of the cooperation with Pakistan because I got to know regional actors through that cooperation in Pakistan. Um, looking back, the state of the art in NLP has changed quite a lot in this time. But actually, in, interestingly, for me at least, the process of building NLP resources has been essentially the same. So the sites tend to do some in initial experimentation with machine learning methods, even back in the 2000s, machine learning was just coming up then, but generally with poor results. So the idea is that you want to build up resources quickly, you want to build up NLP applications quickly, there is a need for that in these countries. But um, there's a realization that for many of the tasks that one is that one is targeting, you actually need annotated and large corpora for learning. And then there's a further realization, usually, that computer scientists lack the necessary linguistic knowledge to build up these high quality linguistically annotated res resources. And I say computer scientists because um, the efforts at making NLP applications have generally come out of computer science departments in South Asia, not out of linguistic departments. Uh, there are very few linguistic departments. I think there's none in Pakistan. So then what happens is <clears throat> you search for linguists to partner with. Now, in places like Pakistan, where there's basically no linguistic departments, this is difficult to do. And in with South Asia, even if you look beyond your own country or your own region, you realize that there's very few linguists with knowledge about the particular language you're trying to target. And even if you find linguists, they don't seem to be able to organize their knowledge in a way that is useful for NLP. <clears throat> so there's very different traditions in linguistics. There's the uh, philological, more descriptive method. There's the new, um, well, not so new anymore, but generative method. And very few of those actually work for computer science needs. So you need to find a linguist who's interested in computational applications and understands what type of knowledge and to what depth needs to be um, conveyed. So this is all difficult, difficulties to overcome. But if you do find a linguist like that, then um, generally there's a period of language analysis. So the N NLP application won't be built tomorrow. Um, unlike the expectations with a lot of the machine learning things um, that you see coming up or that I see in papers that I review, it usually takes a while to build a really good resource. And that's because it does take a while to figure out 
just some major issues and I'll also say basic issues. So what are the main syntactic categories of the language? How does the morphology work? How does one deal with the orthography and with phonological variation? What lexical resources do you need? Well, of course you need lots, but how many can you actually build in a certain amount of time that will be helpful? How does verbal predication work <clears throat> with respect to lexical resources? So these languages have complex predicates where nouns and verbs co combine together adjectives and verbs, verbs and verbs, very different from what English does. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with a case marking system, the very different agree agreement system, gender systems, etc.? So you do have to sort out through these, you have to sort through these issues to some extent, um, because otherwise you'll end up with really, really wrong design decisions and build, end up not being able to build good applications. So once, once these questions have been resolved on even a basic level, you can build useful resources. And here linguists tend to want to do a lot more deep analysis of the language. Um, and wait for many years until they've understood everything, but you can actually build good NLP applications once you've just got some basic useful design decisions done. And this has been the case in the CLE um, collaboration that we've had. And CLE has also been really good at making their resources available, some of them for a fee because they are, um, they have to go find third party funding for all of the work they do. So you can see they've, um, uh, got some corpora out there that you can get. They've got some free web services. There's lots of stuff there. So I've just put their website there for you to look at. So once you've built up these resources via, uh, I haven't talked about this, but I will, uh, via either manual or semi-automatic methods, then you can start applying machine learning techniques to level up the either to either level up the existing resources or to build completely new NLP applications. And with the cooperation in, um, in Pakistan, we have been able to do exactly that. <coughs> if you look at my record, you will realize I'm not a machine learning person. I prefer rule-based systems and deep language analysis, comparative linguistic, but in fact, um, I actually see potential for both if you've built on well-designed uh, resources, then you can go and do um, <clears throat> well-functioning NLP applications. So what we've done here with uh, Tokir Isan, this is his dissertation work, uh, and myself um, supervising, he has been able to build a nice dependency parser for Urdu using the, um, a lot of the resources that were built previously including an annotation scheme for tree banks, which we've published in different papers. But one thing we did struggle with, and I just wanted to say that here, is that it's really difficult once you've built something like this, <clears throat> it's really difficult to evaluate your system in a way that is uh, internationally acceptable because you simply don't have very many resources to evaluate against. So typically it's just you and somebody else and the somebody else is doing something completely different with a completely different annotation scheme. So it's very, very difficult to actually evaluate these things. But even so, progress is being made. So that is very good, I find. And I just wanted to give a um, note um, that essentially the same development cycle has led to the establishment of the Urdu Hindi Tree Bank, which is published in that paper in 2017. And they made a lot of attended resources, morphological parser, syntactic parser, etc. So I've given you a website there. I was involved as a consultant in this project, and it was exactly as I talked about in with the Urdu um, collaboration. Linguists were brought together with computation linguists and computer scientists, and they ended up making a very, very useful tree bank after a period of language analysis and fighting about how to do things. And what you see here is the picture. Uh, the picture I've got here is a dependency parse that they come up with, and you see these little letters in there, K1, K4. So this um, tree bank, this dependency parser is based on Paninese, uh, um, grammar of Sanskrit, so Panini's uh, way of doing dependency parsing, which they adopted for Hindi, which is quite reasonable, I think. Right, so I've been talking about language analysis, etc. 
And um, I just wanted to make this point as well, so that linguists, they acquire, as part of their training, they acquire quite a bit of knowledge about language structure in general and how languages differ. So you are taught about your language area, you learn about how your language family compares to other language families, what's special about them, what types of things languages do, what types of things languages are not expected to do, etc. So as a linguist, when you come to an underdescribed or underanalyzed language, as is routinely the case for me in, in the South Asian setting, um, <clears throat> this knowledge, this general comparative linguistic knowledge that I have can be brought to bear um, on understanding these languages. And I'm, there's many linguists in the world who will have this type of knowledge, but again, it is very difficult to translate this sort of lang linguistic general knowledge that one has into an NLP friendly format. And I wanted to say one exception is Emily Bender, who has really done a very good job of trying to put together in very slim volumes, some fundamentals for NLP. The first one by herself from uh, focuses on morphology and syntax, and the second one on together with Alex Lascarides from Edinburgh on semantics and pragmatics. And these are really meant to give you a, <clears throat> a first sort of insight in if you're trying to do an LLP application for a new language, here's some of the things to watch out for. And I find this is very important and this is the type of thing that should be done more of. <coughs> okay, now <clears throat> I'd love to talk at length about language analysis and in the, the structure of these languages in depth, but I think this is not the space to do this here. But I'd like to talk just a little bit about part of speech tagging to illustrate what I mean about uh, why language analysis is important. So assigning a part of speech tag to an item is one of the very basic tasks in linguistic analysis. It's really, really basic. Um, but as you can see from the quotes here, it's also difficult. So Mark Twain in his essay on the awful German language notes that there are 10 parts of speech in German and they are all troublesome. Uh, Otto Jespersen in his Grammar of English says the definitions of parts of speech are very far from having attained the degree of exactitude found in Euclidean geometry. So you'd like to have an exact system, but it's very difficult. Um, there's many in-between categories, so things like deverbal, adjectival, participle, should they be verbs, should they be adjectives, should one have a new category, what should this category be called? This is actually a current issue that is going on in the Tamil resource development because there was some tag that people decided to use in the universal dependency tree bank for Tamil, but this tag is clearly not satisfactory and there's been some back and forth about how to fix it, but it's not really, there doesn't seem to be a clear way forward and I'll have to take a look at this as well. So then the question is how granular an analysis should be, how to deal with foreign or borrowed items, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many things one can spend a lot of time on resolving. Now what's interesting about part of speech tagging is that it's determined almost wholly on the basis of distributional characteristics. So where is it in a sentence? What type of morphology? Which context? So with which words does it tend to appear? And in a sense, this is an ideal task for machine learning because machine learning is paying attention to distributional characteristics which is presumably also why part of speech tagging has um, been such a success within machine learning. But as far as I can tell, linguistic analysis has so far had to provide an initial basis for learning. This I think is still true even with all the hype about word embeddings. And the general cycles in development have are usually the same ones basically as I've talked about before. You propose an initial tag set based on some linguistic insights, that you have about the language. <clears throat> you take a first grammar, you look at that, you look around, see if there's established tag sets like the Penn Tree Bank tag set that you might get some inspiration from. Nowadays, there's also some <clears throat> very nicely, some generalized guidelines, recommendations at a very high level. So the universal dependency, universal part of speech tags, that's quite nice. <coughs> and then with that initial tag set, you um, do manual or semi-automatic tagging of a chosen corpus, and you do machine learning based on this tag corpus, and then you go back and do an error analysis, see what worked, what didn't work. And generally, <clears throat> things that didn't work well in machine learning, it's often because the tag set 
has not been designed so that it really takes care of the distribution characteristics in the right way, which is why the system cannot learn it properly. So I've seen this cycle happen with the German tax set. I was around when that happened, the Stuttgart Tübingen tax set. And they went through many cycles of figuring out granularity of the tax set, et cetera, et cetera. And now it seems to be quite well established. With respect to Urdu, um, one has now it's been going on long enough that one has found the same cycle of development, but not in one site as there was with the German development, with the development of the German tax set. Well, there was two sites, Stuttgart and Tübingen, but they did it all by themselves. But in with respect to Urdu, there have been several sites or several um, initiatives that have uh, tried to tackle this. So just to tell you what the descriptive grammar does. So Schmidt, Ruth Laila Schmidt's descriptive grammar of Urdu does 10 part of speech tags. This is a fairly good grammar of Urdu. The first computational tag set, however, had 350 tags. So very, very fine granularity. And one of the first corpora in Urdu available was tagged with this, the Emil corpus. Sajad and Schmidt, <clears throat> working six years later, instead proposed 42 tags, which is a lot more easy to learn for any machine learning system. The Universal Dependency Guidelines provide 17 high-level tags, but these are very high-level, right? So they're not going to be very useful for actual NLP applications where you will need to know about more details. And there's also an effort to provide unifying guidelines for Indian languages that has 11 major tags and 18 attributes for those tags. So that is also along those same lines. So there's some um, bit, some, uh, work to base oneself on. And when we got around to thinking about part of speech tagging, uh, thankfully, as part of the German Pakistan DAD Corporation, DAD, DAD Corporation, we were able to invest time towards building resources for Urdu NLP. And CLE wanted to sit back and really do a high quality corpus. So they'd been putting together corpora in various different ways, but none of these were balanced. They had all kinds of problems. And so they actually spent the time to put together a balanced high quality corpus called the Urdu Digest Corpus. I've given you <clears throat> an excerpt here and you can see it's in the Urdu script. It's written from right to left. So with this corpus existing, then one wanted to add high quality annotations to it. And one of the first basic things to do is to add POS. So we informed ourselves for, with regard to previous efforts and the unifying standards. But actually what mainly guided our part of speech tag development set, our development of the part of speech tag set, was our extensive knowledge about the language that we'd gathered while doing an LFG-based grammar writing exercise, not exercise, but a project in the early parts of our cooperation. And I'll talk about um, this a little bit more in the program section. So we'd actually done, we'd actually written a, a rule-based system for Urdu, and we'd learned a lot about the Urdu structure, the structure of Urdu, which we could then use towards understanding how to do part of speech tagging. So in the end, I think I'm quite pleased with the scheme that has come up. <clears throat> we have um, published that in a paper fairly recently, well, not that recent anymore, 2014. Um, so I think it's a nicely linguistically informed, but also computationally viable annotation scheme. There are 12 major tags with subdivisions. So you have a total of 32 tags. Um, we try to conform to the standardized recommendations, particularly the ones for Indian languages. <clears throat> but we had to include Urdu language particular phenomena as well. Um, and make sure that we actually had enough tags and the right kinds of divisions the right kinds of categories for downstream applications. So this was very important to us. And you can see up there on the right, I've given you a picture of what the tag corpus looks like. And a lot of the tags should, should look familiar to you. So JJ and NN, those are from the Pentry Bank tag set. Right, so that is nice. Um, so here's the summary for that. So machine learning has yielded high performing part of speech taggers, but part of speech tagging is not an end unto itself. This I think is an important point. One needs to think about what the downstream applications are and design the tag set um, according to that. 
I'd like to do a little point here is that I think one could also um, think about building hybrid systems in the long run, or maybe the time now is set for that, because there's some parts of the language which are actually easily identifiable, and they're very few in number. So you could identify these and then combine these with a the language model um, and save the learning time for things that are actually really easy to just know. And the reason I'm saying is, is that I once reviewed a paper where um, they were trying to learn a tag set and for some reason, the negation, they either learned 0% of the time or they learned it 100% of the time. Now, they didn't conclude anything from this, but basically they're just in that language, there were three negative markers. Those were easy to identify. If they'd just been able to identify those, put those aside and say, okay, whenever we find these three markers, we just slap the neg part of speech tag on it. And then we try to learn the rest. That would have been a lot easier than mucking about with that, in my opinion. Right, so now we need to move on to <clears throat> another topic. So having built basic NLP resources for Urdu the, in our cooperation, we were able to move on to more challenging tasks. So this is more recent work. <coughs> CLE has now been able to develop a text-to-speech system for Urdu. And text-to-speech is particularly critical for areas like South Asia, which have widespread illiteracy. I think it's still up to 90% that can't actually read and write. <clears throat> so what you would like to have is applications that can just read out loud things to you from the web, etc., as, as well. Um, but as one knows, the production of natural-sounding speech requires an integration of prosody, and this is challenging. It's unsolved even in well-studied languages like English. Uh, one needs to solve various problems, how which phonetic cues translate into which categories. You have to know which categories they are in the first place. This, again, involves linguistic analysis. Then you have to go into the phonetics and understand which categories are signaled by these phonetic cues. And then uh, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one thing. And then you have to develop, again, a viable annotation schema. So there is an Urdu speech corpus that CLE has developed. It's about three hours of speech, um, and I've given you the particulars there. And it's been annotated for word at the word level, stress, break index, and intonation. And intonation is what I'm going to focus on here. So here's a typical um, annotated speech signal. Tamam adibonko apni baradri khayal karte hain. So Urdu intonation is mainly a pattern of low high on prosodic phrases. You can see that um, over here, low high, low high, low high, low high, and then at the end it goes down. The last phrase in declaratives is always low for some reason. So what you can see here is um, you have the word level uh, transcribed into IPA, you have an English gloss, <clears throat> you have the intonation, low, high uh, in, um, annotation. So there's quite a lot going on here, and there could be even more. But that's just some of the basic things. So you can see that the doing that manually is difficult and time-consuming. It really takes a lot of time. CLE has decided to use semi-automatic methodology. <coughs> They've implemented a stress, alg stress algorithm that helps determine the prosodic phrasing, and they do semi-automatic annotation of intonation and prosodic phrases depending. So they do that depending on what they've already identified via linguistic analysis of a certain set of the data. And then they feed that into a system. They automatically annotate and then check that and then keep expanding the automatic annotation system. And then once <clears throat> enough initial data has been annotated, they extend that by doing a machine learning um, model on that which then also is able to <clears throat> provide a language model for the prosodic patterns, which can be fed into the text-to-speech system. And the first experiments with the prosodic knowledge, uh, with this feeding into the text-to-speech system, found that it was actually able to improve the text-to-speech system quite nicely. So that is good. So again, this annotation, the prosodic annotation, uh, proceeded cyclically in our collaboration and in a an initial annotation scheme was developed. We did revisions due to problems, inconsistencies found during the manual annotation. 
then another set of revisions due to problems in consistencies detected during the automatic annotation and a re-annotation of these things, and then the whole cycle again. And what was interesting for me as part of this um, process is that some of the non-conforming patterns that the CLE team found, they made absolutely no sense to them. So they weren't sure what they were supposed to do about these. So how were they supposed to revise their analyses? So now I have very little expertise in prosody, but given my general comparative linguistic knowledge, I could actually look at it very quickly <clears throat> and find some generalizable reasons for seemingly puzzling patterns. And that could then feed into the annotation scheme and redo, be redone. So that's actually what we're doing right now. So some of the generalizable cases involved, case clitics, focus clitics, negation, question words, compounding, derivation morphology. As a linguist, you know that these tend to have special properties. So it's not surprising that they have special properties uh, with respect to prosody. So here's an example. Unki zaban o kalem se kon bachahe. It's a question. <clears throat> well, it's supposed to be a question. <clears throat> and you can see there's supposed to be a low high, but here's a very, very steep drop. Here's a low high, it's higher than the other ones. That's not supposed to happen, but this is a question word. You can see that here. Um, so you can say question words tend to have a focus intonation on them. So that makes sense there. There is a case clitic here, which doesn't end up being high like it should. Case clitics are clitics in this language. So there's some reason to do that. <clears throat> so one can start bringing analysis there and say, hey, you should expect weird patterns on case clitics. You should expect weird patterns on question words. Well, not weird, but a different type of pattern from what you're looking at, and then build that into your system. So that's what we're doing right now. Okay, so <clears throat> prosody summary text-to-speech is interesting, uh, I think, because the, you need to both work with rule-based algorithms and machine learning in order to get a really good functioning system going. <coughs> Because if you're going to produce natural sounding speech, you actually need to integrate prosody. And prosody is difficult, it's under researched, but there's a lot of scope here for both a combination of linguistic analysis and machine learning systems. Okay, so <clears throat> I've done now with the Urdu case study, and I'd like to quickly go into linguistic generalizations and say how I work. So linguistic insights do not occur in a vacuum. They are formed and tested as part of expectations from generated from a particular theory of language. And I work within a theory called lexical functional grammar, LFG. <clears throat> this has been very strong in terms of integrating typological information and uh, is very much oriented towards computational modeling. So it's, it's a computational friendly theory. And um, it, interestingly, it integrates both constituency structure, that's called the C structure, as well as dependency information, F structure, which are actually cleanly separated out. So it can do both dependency parsing and constituency parsing, but all in the same system. So it's the basis for, LFG has been the basis for the computational pargram effort, parallel grammar. This began in 1996 long time ago now with three sites, Park in Palo Alto doing English, Xerox Grenoble doing French, IMS Stuttgart doing German. It's still ongoing <clears throat> with not as much energy as in the beginning years, but it's still ongoing. And um, <clears throat> in a way it's been a victim of its own success because it was led by Pargram for many years. <coughs> but um, Pargram was led by Park for many years. And Park started a startup PowerSet, where a lot of the people who are working on Pargram moved to PowerSet, which was then bought by Microsoft, and then went the way many things go with Microsoft. But we're still around. And it's been used, the overall goal of Pargram was the, or is the computational grammar development for diverse sets of languages via a joint development platform, XLE, and via a common linguistic understanding given by LFG. So the languages over the years that we've been able to tackle, I've given you there. It's quite a diverse set of languages. It would be nice to have more, but we've done pretty well in terms of having some African languages, Wolof, Tigrinya, um, many, Euro not many, but several different European languages. So English, French, German, Hungarian, Norwegian, Polish, Welsh. Uh, then we have Georgian, Malagasy, Indonesian, Urdu, and Turkish, as well as Chinese and Japanese. 
So you have grammars for these languages, <clears throat> but as part of creating the grammars, you also, we created a lot of resources that are very useful. Um, generally language particular standalone morphological analyzers, typically implemented with XF XFST, which was developed um, by Park and Xerox Grenoble. And there's a very nice book, Finite State Morphology, which teaches you how to use that. Language particular lexicons with subcat information and tree banks, a subset of which we have managed to make parallel and aligned. More on that in a bit. Write-ups on design decisions <coughs> and some starter grammars to bootstrap new languages on the basis of our multilingual experience. So what we've done, for example, is we've written all this down, we've given you starter grammars, and we've given you specifications for features and feature spaces based on the comparative grammar writing experience. So what are possible values for gender, number, case, verbal type, etc. So I've given you sample feature space here for specifiers, which could be adjective quantifiers, determiners, numbers, possessors, etc. And among the determiners, <clears throat> you could have something that is a definite, a demonstrative, this box, an indefinite, an interrogative, which box, etc. So if you're starting a new language, you can get these specifications for the feature space, and you can look if this feature space applies to your language, if it's got everything, <clears throat> you might go looking for it, or if you need to extend it. But there's a lot of valuable knowledge collected there already. Um, and I'll skip this. XLE still needs to be obtained via license from PARC, um, but there is now a, 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 we're trying to pry it out of PARC and make it fully open source. That'll happen soon, I hope. There's a nice web interface available at Bergen in the meantime, which the Enes project has made. There you can interact with existing grammars, upload your own grammars and access tree banks. And in particular, the Pargram bank collects parallel and aligned tree banks across a diverse set of languages. Um, you can access it there and there are the languages that are in there. And we're currently adding Tamil. So let me now turn to Tamil in the remaining minutes of the talk. Uh, again, this is a DAD Sri Lanka German corporation, and we're looking at, I already said this, looking at Tamil and Sinhalese. I'm involved mainly in the Tamil so far. The cooperation partners are Sarves and Gihan Dias, uh, so K. Sarves Varan, I should say. And um, in, building these collabor in building these resources, that's been the usual trajectory. You have initial experiments with machine learning yielding low results a realization that one needed to do a different approach, take a step back, begin with building resources via rule-based systems that can then enable downstream machine learning. And uh, the group in Colombo decided to invest time building a program style grammar for Tamil and getting attendant resources done as well by that. So the targeted resources are finite state morphology, uh, lexicons and automatically generated parses that can be stored in a Tamil tree bank. <clears throat> There's also an effort to have this annotated tree bank uh, to be fed into ML, ML systems, but also to link it to universal dependencies. And this should be fairly easy because LFG already contains a dependency representation and was in fact, the universal dependency set was actually in inspired by LFG system of organization. So that should be easy to do. So this is all dissertation work by um, Sarvis Varan, which is happening at the moment. Um, and it's interesting for me because Tamil is a challenging case for NLP. There's complex orthography, complex morphophonology, predicate, complex predication. Syntax is interesting, but purely described. Um, and one knows very little about its semantics and pragmatics. Uh, I've given you an example here just as a flavor. I won't go through it much, but just note that you have this complementizer that which has lots of inflections. Now, this is typologically quite unusual, and we've spent a little bit of time trying to understand that. We are publishing a paper this year on that, so there'll be some new research on Tamil. Tamil is under-researched. Um, all the same things apply. A lot of the descriptive material is over 100 years old. Very few linguists with Tamil expertise, and of those linguists, again, pretty much none with understanding how to organize the information for computational purposes. <clears throat> so this has been a frustrating realization for the Colombo team. And I've been able to help them by leveraging my comparative linguistic knowledge about South Asian, 
and in particular leverage the partner multilingual experience. And uh, things like there'll be claims in the literature like, oh, Tamil has 38 auxiliaries. Now, if that's just that would be really unusual if that were true. So we're looking into that and that's clearly not true. That just has been misdescribed. And so work like that needs to be done. Okay, here's a sample parse from the Tama grammar, just for fun. So you can see a little bit of the orthography and you can see what that looks like. You have your constituent structure and your F structure. It's a coordinated sentence. We will buy okra and ash plantain. And you can see all the different features that are actually available in there. Very, very detailed analysis from which you can then derive many other applications. So the uh, goal in Sri Lanka is to build openly accessible resources. <clears throat> they've been frustrated because there have been several previous stabs at morphological analyzers, but none of them are openly available. So the current of effort is programmed in OpenFST. And after one year, just one year of effort, it has all the inflectional forms in it, and the grammar and morphological analyzer are able to parse elementary school textbooks. So I'm putting an effort on that <clears throat> because after one year of effort, of concerted effort, you have a resource that is already functioning rather than having spent one year with machine learning and not having a functioning system. Um, so particularly with respect to morphological analysis, I don't really understand why one tries to do machine learning for that in the first place, because the morphology of a language has only finite state complexity. The morphological inflections are finite in nature. The program experience has shown that a concerted effort of one or two years tends to give a robust, workable, finite state morphological analyzer for a language. So why not do that? Well, the, and the technology is not difficult to use or program, and the algorithms and the complexity issues are very well understood. So why not do that? I guess the main problem is that one needs linguistic knowledge, which is difficult for computer scientists to acquire. Um, and in fact, if the language is understudied, it's difficult for anybody to acquire. So what should the solution be? Well, I think the solution should be that one should invest in linguistics and get more linguistic knowledge out there, get more typological comparative knowledge out there to help in resource creation, rather than spending millions and millions on new servers. Right, so here are the concluding remarks. Most of the efforts that have produced usable high quality resources for further NLP processing applications have partnered, as far as I can see, with computationally interested linguists, invested initially heavily in intelligent manual annotation, refined their guidelines over several cycles, <clears throat> and then were able to deploy that in terms of deploy those resources in terms of machine learning, language models, which could be used in further NLP applications. So um, you know all this already, so I won't spend time on this. Many annotations applications are very English oriented, but English is typologically odd. So comparative linguistic work is very, very important. And this workshop is there for a very timely enterprise. I'd like to uh, finish with thanks to collaborators, um, just giving you the list of collaborators who have contributed to this work here directly. And otherwise, I would just like to thank you for listening.